you how they got it wrong. I'm not 70. But when I'm 70 years old, me drinking this water, speeding down the highway, um, at 70, a liter a day, I don't care if I get bladder cancer. That's a risk I'm willing to take. But we're not talking about 70-year-old white working males. We're talking about pregnant women. Although over 600 disinfection byproducts have been isolated and identified, this represents only a fraction of these materials. Next slide. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. Next slide. Internationally recognized toxicologists. As was said earlier, you show me three scientists, I'll show you three scientists, they'll say the other. It's just the way it is. But you know what? That list of 90,000 chemicals that hasn't been tested for human, you know, bioassays and what's it doing to us? Chloramine's on that list. You can't find one study of chloramine in human health effects. They don't exist, okay? They don't study chlorine. They don't study chloramine. What they study is their disinfection byproducts. That's where the toxicological work is done. This guy, Dr. Poa, at the uh, University of Illinois, he says that when they get around to regulating those chloraminated ones, they are going to be magnitudes greater. I've heard a thousand times more toxic than the trihalomethanes that they're regulating today. A thousand times more toxic. You can call this guy, he's still at the University of Illinois. His cohort at the US Department of, or US Environmental Protection Agency, Dr. Susan Richardson, she spoke out publicly. She, she spoke out publicly. She got fired. Next slide. What are some of the issues? This is what you're gonna hear about. You start Googling, these are the things you're gonna hear about. Let's put them in perspective. We got health effects. Immediate, chronic, long-term. You got property damage, lead and copper leaching. There are no lead services in Stockton. But every service in Stockton has a brass water meter. That brass water meter is 17% lead. The American Water Works Association just changed the law in 2014 on what lead can be in a brass water meter. 2014. Okay? So everybody that's in North Stockton has a brass water meter that's 17% lead that maintains a chamber of water, which is why they test for lead and copper in the first flush. So if you get up and get that first cup of coffee in the morning, or your child gets up and takes that first drink, that's where the high lead levels are found. And it's not coming from a lead service, it's coming from grass. Plumbing repairs and gas damage. This one's my favorite because the president of the Tulsa Water Authority owns the Black Rubber Gasket Company. And on his webpage, you can Google this tonight. On his webpage, he tells you the dangers of chloramine. And actually sat there with a, you know what, eating grin, the night I made my presentation, said, I'm gonna make a lot of money. Appliances, these are never considered. These are never considered. Your dishwasher has rubber O-rings in it. Your clothes washer, rubber O-rings in it. You have a filter behind your refrigerator that's designed to take out chlorine. Chloramine's gonna go right through it. It's got rubber gaskets, hot waters. You know the, the, the washerless faucets? They have little black O-rings in them. Make the Water Act standards for the following substances. Selenium, bromide, boron, methyl mercury, group A pesticides, which are human carcinogens, toxic algal blooms. Those toxic algal blooms give off byproducts that lead to liver cancer and liver failure. In addition, the salinity will increase to the point where our current Delta water intake facility will no longer function as built. So we've made the investment. We're here to debate how it should be managed. But if this project comes to pass, that system won't work for us any longer. And of course, regular filtration can't remove 
methylmercury, selenium, and some of the other substances I mentioned. So my call to each and every one of you today, and this is an important call, is to remember um, when thinking about things at the local level, it's kind of akin, in a way, to be working on railroad tracks presently. Not that it isn't important, not that it isn't done, not that we shouldn't have good citizen oversight to keep our water supply system safe, but we have a major train ready to run over this region. And so I, I ask that you keep that all in mind because we could be worried at this level about water treatment and we could completely mess what is heading straight for us. Um, last, Restore the Delta has a proven track record of long-term advocacy. We've pushed back on the state for nine years. It's really hard to get up and fight a beloved governor in a blue state every day, trust me. This is a pivotal year for us, um, and as long as we stay focused, I do believe through a combination of activities we will win this fight. Californians are with us. We welcome citizen partners. We want you to safeguard water quality at the local level, and of course to join our growing ranks. We're happy to share techniques with you for conducting sound science and economic research for the questions at hand. And I can't stress this enough today. You know, real change comes from having an equal balance of head and heart. Um, you want to listen. You have to remember that for every three studies somebody can give you, someone can push back and give you three and they contradict information. What really works is when the best minds are asking questions and they work towards a broad consensus of verifiable knowledge. The base of knowledge is what makes for good government. It makes for an enlightened community that can make wise decisions and protect itself and grow for the common good. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I would like to introduce to you my colleague and friend uh, from the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, Bill Jennings. Thank you. Bay. 
And where does that water go? It goes to those canals that you see down the I-5 when you're driving to Los Angeles. These vol large volumes of what we call water exports from the Delta have changed the quality and the quantity of the fresh water in our system. It's having horrific water quality impacts for fisheries, which are on the verge of collapsing, and negative impacts on water quality for agriculture, business, and our drinking water. The problem you see is that the water coming off the San Joaquin River is heavily polluted with salty drainage water from all the large agribusiness that you see down that I-5 corridor when you're driving to LA. San Joaquin River water has a high salinity load because those large tracts of corporate farmland down the I-5 were once an inland sea. Overpumping removes too much of the fresh quality Sacramento River water and that allows salt to intrude back from the bay portion of the estuary into the delta. So we get hit with the salt twice and the pollutants from the San Joaquin River and then a backload of salt from the bay. The effects, uh, this affects the water quality uh, including our drinking water. Worst of all, 70% of the water taken from the Delta goes to irrigate these same corporate farms that belch pollution back into the Delta and back into our drinking water supply. Very often I will hear Northern Californians talk about, well, the problem is all the water we send to Los Angeles. The truth is, if we only had to share drinking water with our urban neighbors in normal years, the estuary would be pretty healthy. It's the 80% um, of the almonds that are set for export that are grown in the, uh, the desert uh, that really are creating havoc for us uh, in the estuary. Further complicating matters, uh, you'll see a red line up there. That's the line for the delta tunnels that Governor Brown is pushing. He wants to build two twin tunnels, boondoggle tunnels, that cost before uh, overruns and interest $17 billion. They're 35 miles long. They're four stories long, each in diameter. And they can divert at least half, even more, of the Sacramento River. And they plan on starting them just south of Sacramento. That means that we in the Delta and in the city of Stockton are going to lose a significant portion of that quality Sacramento River water before it enters the Delta. It's going to starve the San Francisco Delta on the bay of the water it needs. Um, I can talk to you at a different time about the horrific impacts that we'll have on agriculture, on our economy, on our iconic fisheries and wildlife. Uh, what I want to end with today is the impacts on water quality for our drinking water. Boat this comes morning. in, you get scale, scale is a biological process. All the different things, corrosion, you get the organisms in there, you get all that slime that grows in the bottom there, and you see other coliforms? In drinking water, the only bacteria we test for is coliform. And it's an indicator. It's much like the THMs that we test for. If there's coliform present, you all have it on your hands right now. Coliform is, is a pretty, you know, popular bug. It's out there in the environment. So we test for that in drinking water. If it's present, then you test for E. coli, which is the much more dangerous bacteria. But you only test for the presence or absence. There's no number. It's, there's either coliform present, and you did a bad job, or there's coliform not present, and everything's okay. What you don't test for, that's starting to become very common because of this rapid switch for stage two disinfection byproduct compliance, a lot more E. coli outbreaks. Legionella, like we've never seen before. Brain-eating amoeba in the southern states. People ask me, there were 20 water systems in Louisiana that had the brain-eating amoeba in the drinking water supply, and just like Legionella, if you drink it, you'll kill it. But if you're in the bathtub or you're in the shower and you inhale it, it can cause problems. <clears throat> Why didn't we find brain-eating amoeba in other places? They didn't test for it. A sure-fired way to prove something doesn't exist is don't test for it. It ain't there. This is what, what biofilm looks like. Um, the brain-eating amoeba is that big word on the bottom there in Latin. It's just called the brain-eating amoeba. Next slide. This is what a chlorine burnout is. Okay? Now, some people will tell you we can manage it and you'll never have to do it. 
I submit to you most systems have to do it. As a matter of fact, there are a number of states, a number of states, North Carolina, Texas, that require annual chlorine burns. Now let me explain that process to you. You turn the ammonia off, you turn the chlorine up, and then you flush the, the fire hydrants down the street until you flush all that biofilm and nitrification and slime out of your pipes. Okay, that's a chlorine burnout. And they do them at least a month, way past six weeks. Most systems have gone as long as that we're experiencing go about 85 days. Why? Because 85 days fit in that 90 day window when you test for trihalomethanes. It's the funniest thing. Most chlorine burnouts start off on the weekend of the 4th of July. They take their June quarterly samples, turn the ammonia off, turn the chlorine up, and start burning the snot out of the distribution system. What happens when they increase chlorine into a system that's full of organic material? Trihalomethanes, they blow past 80, blow past 150. They go 200, 300 parts, we see. Okay? But it doesn't matter, because we don't have to test for it until the end of the 90-day period. So you just all get to consume those high levels of trihalomethane for that 90-day period. And then even if they screw up and they actually take a test, they get to average it out over the year anyway. And I want to explain to you about that whole long-term running annual average. But that's okay, because it's only going to cause 70-year-old men a 1 in 10,000 greater chance of getting cancer, right? Okay, burn out the environment. Where does the sediment, biofilm, and high level of chlorine, because sometimes the chlorine's in there because they're burning it out, but the initial flushes are chloramine, where's it going? Right in the middle of the ship. I can, I can get a hint of chlorine in the morning. And then the other half of the year, I'm on delta um, treated surface water. When I open the tap up, it smells like somebody just flushed the toilet, but I'm on the delta water. But I'm on it down in Los Angeles. And I will tell you, when we switch to chloraminated delta water on that seasonal switch, I have a child that breaks out in rashes. These are all the things you're going to see. And I'm going to offer to you, there are no scientific studies that prove any of these. There just aren't. But you know what causes you harm and you know what doesn't. I'm not going to stand up here and pretend to be a doctor, because I'm not. Next. Property damage. Metal plumbing. Brass fixtures and fittings, faucets. Bronze fixtures and fittings. The only thing that was exempted, and it was a huge lobby that did it, the bronze fire hydrants can stay bronze because they think that the water gets stuck up in them and it's not going to come out and harm you, and they're probably right. But brass fire hydrants are the only thing that can keep the lead in. Galvanized fixtures and fittings, chrome plated fixtures and fittings. Chloramine is a stronger and longer lasting oxidant, as been mentioned numerous times. It's simply a concept that you understand. Chlorine, as a disinfectant, it goes in the water, kills bacteria. Chlorine that's hanging on to its fat, lazy cousin, ammonia, it's going to last in the pipes a long time, 28 days. And it just hangs out like this. And then when it gets time to like react with some of the scale and deposits that are in the pipes, the chlorine breaks off, leaves the ammonia that causes its own set of problems. But if a fire hydrant gets knocked off, and all that chloramine water comes out, and it goes into the storm drain, and it goes out into a channel. Like, um, they just had in Palo Alto, that gets water off the Hedge Hedge system from San Francisco. Massive fish kill in the creek. Why? Because the chloramine will make it all the way into the ecosystem, where the chlorine will evaporate off. Next slide. Plumbing and gasket damage. I went into this at great lengths. All the black gaskets. Something that Aaron and I were just made aware of within the last 48 hours, um, the plastic pipes, there's a new one, the blue ones, that they're, they're kind of the snap together plastic pipes that they're putting under sinks and things like that. Um, it's called PEX, P-E-X, and um, they're, they're really worried about the chloramine leaching those chemicals out of those pipes. Next. Distribution system fouling. Nitrification is a microbiological process, converts ammonia and similar nitrogen compound into nitrite, and then nitrate. Nitrification can occur in water systems that use chloramine for their residual disinfectant, distribution system disinfection. 
Now they're going to tell you, we can manage that. We're really good at that. I will tell you that even the large, wonderful, and powerful Metropolitan Water District of Southern California with their water quality lab of 85 people and all their grade 5 treatment operators are going to have to do a chlorine burn this year. Okay, because they have a nitrification problem. So even the big...